Всем привет, это проект Альфа. Hello everybody, this is Project Alpha. My name is Nikolai Feldman. You are watching in live uh, World Diary with Alexei Rostovich. Hello, Alexei. Well, we have weathered the scary blow, retaliation from Russia for incursion into Kursk district. This was the most massive attack that we have uh, survived. This war lasts for over 900 days already, and uh, today Putin has uh, launched over $1.3 billion worth of different missiles and uh, UAVs on different targets in Ukraine. How would you estimate the effectiveness of this attack? I would not estimate it myself. I would uh, use the data coming from people who have access to some information and sometimes speak about that out loud, right? As I usually say, those taxi drivers, so Kievan taxi drivers. Let's put it uh, in the most delicate way that this missile attack failed to achieve desired goals. Of course, it did uh, hit certain targets. There was some damage done, but overall, one billion. 300 million dollars could have been used more effectively than uh, how they used them. All right, so still speaking of energy infrastructure, this was the main target of this attack. There is uh, some data coming that some missiles actually did hit some objects. So what do we know about the threat of a blackout for the country? That is often talked about in European media. Well. Professional energy engineers and uh, people working in this industry who have a full picture should probably discuss the full blackout possibility. But I want to say that I do not believe in a full blackout in ter on the territory of Ukraine, because we have a lot of nuclear power stations generating energy. And in order to cause a full blackout, uh, one would need to take them out too. Um, I doubt they will. And uh, they likely, and they're continuing to attack the infrastructure. Infrastructure is something that you can rebuild within a day or two, sometimes maybe two or three weeks, but overall you can repair that and you can uh, get the energy back to consumers. So regardless of how this conflict unfolds, uh, it will be a problem for us to figure out how to deliver energy from power stations, from nuclear power stations to consumers, but it's a much easier task than rebuilding the whole station. If they damage hydroelectric or traditional coal electric stations, then yeah, that might, those might have been gone for a long time. But as for nuclear, they will probably still carry the brunt of the load. And these power stations will continue likely working for decades according to their current capability. And um, due to nuclear energy, we're doing all right. There was another element there. Remember at the beginning of summer when they were attacking our infrastructure and we had some issues with energy because two blocks of uh, the bigger station were in repairs. So it did put additional strain on the system. But uh, overall, you can see that for a while we've been surviving without any disconnects and uh, We've been having electricity for 24 hours. That's why I do not see us uh, having to survive winter without energy 24-7. So however much they're going to dump from the Russian side into this, I don't think this is an achievable goal. All right, so Diewald published that the West probably should remove the limitations on the longer range arms that uh, were transferred to Ukraine. Do you think this is a reason or perhaps uh, additional nudge to remove the last red line, the last red tape, and allow Ukraine to use NATO arms to attack uh, targets within Russia proper? Well, first of all, thank you, Diewald, for writing that. A lot of uh, articles are afraid to put uh, that, such a statement in print. And there are a lot of people who are bringing up this topic. Let's remove these limitations. And it's both from the civilian to the military side. They see this asymmetry and they're asking the right question. How can you wage a war? How can you def defend yourself when you're being attacked from 2,000 miles away and all you can do is maybe 300 kilometers around the front line? Or with some um, homemade uh, one or two uh, UAVs that can fly that far. So thank you for the voice, that's important. I don't know what it will lead to, there's a lot of argument going back and forth in the West, but perhaps we will have a chance. Uh, Biden's main framework that they continue to tote is uh, to make sure the conflict does not leave the borders of Ukraine. Well, the conflict has already spilled out, symbolically and uh, factually. Belarus is already amassing some troops on the border with some ex-Wagnerites, not big ones, but still. Uh, UAV flew into the 
territory of Poland, uh, different attacks happened on the territory of Moldova, and um, Ukraine is already attacking far beyond the territory of Ukraine inside Russia. So I'm asking a careful question of these taxi drivers. Perhaps we should stop doing that. Perhaps we should be actually fighting the way we can and not limiting ourselves, not tying our hands. Why are you guys blocking our use of your storm shadows and some other t vehicles? Because Russians continue to hit from 2,000, from 3,000 3, kilometers. And the key for us to maintain stability on the front, to maintain some parity, is to call the Russian side advantage in aviation and in these long-range missiles. If we manage to land their aviation, to not let them use so widely, then it would be much more difficult for Russian troops to continue attacking our uh, Pokrovsk and Taretsk directions, because how they win there, they dump a lot of uh, lighting bombs and then they come on the destroyed territory. So, the, if we manage to fix this asymmetry, that would be a great task, a great uh, achievement. And that's why you can see there are a lot of public statements coming out from different directions saying, let Ukraine use long, longer range uh, weapons. Because 70% of Russian airfields that are used to attack Ukraine, they are within reach, if that limitation is removed. So, we could have compensated for disparity. We've used drones to attack a few airfields, and even those who are counting, being counters, uh, acknowledge that recently we blew up six uh, jets on the field in Russia. In reality, there were a bit more, but uh, six definitely confirmed 100%. All right, Alexei, so in relation with Kursk operation, two sources, Le Monde and Washington Post, have already talked about secret negotiations that were ongoing in uh, Doha, Qatar, that uh, they were blown apart by Kursk operation of Ukraine. And different sources comment on that. Some sources say that negotiations indeed were ongoing, but uh, they failed to achieve a desired outcome because Russia withdrew. Other sources were saying that negotiations were supposed to happen, but Russia withdrew before they started. So what do we know, if anything, about these negotiations? Washington Post is also writing, commenting on the probability of them going. Were they happening? Do you know? Well, let's put it this way, Nikolai. I've uh, said it a lot before, and I'll uh, repeat again that, as I would say, where, let's say, Boston taxi drivers, right? Um, they're saying that negotiations continue happening. There are official ones, like Stumble negotiations early on, and there are a lot of unofficial ones still going. The main framework is being supported by United States. There are at least five different lines of negotiations ongoing simultaneously. Some of the achievements we see in exchange of prisoners of war. These are obvious results. In uh, other negotiations, this is not so obvious. And when they fail through, Russia continues to attack energy targets on uh, the territory of Ukraine. And I did make a post today. Um, not everybody reads uh, social, but I'll repeat it here in the video. We do not need sporadic steps from Russia in the right direction. We need them to start moving to negotiate for peace. For now, they're moving in that direction from time to time and from the position of power. We need to show them, our goal is to show them that power can be wielded by both sides. Right now, we have an interesting situation when they're missing numbers of troops on the front in order to continue effectively. Kursk operation showed us uh, that it takes them an effort to move troops from one part to another, and it may take them weeks. They already are removing operative reserves, and they're throwing them, uh, they're already tapping in, in them. Um, tacticals already in action. They removed some troops from Chasavyar, some of them went to Taryetsk, some to Pakrovsk, some to Kursk, and they need to conduct mobilization, a very unpopular measure in Russia. They are trying to avoid it by any means. They have issues with economy. They have issues with positioning of their goods and uh, trade with their main economic partners like China and India. And that's on one hand. On the other hand, we started hitting them pretty far with the means that we develop here in Ukraine. So these changes were accumulating for a while and now they're getting realized. The intensity, the efficacy, the precision of our strikes is growing. 
Plus, uh, we recently have seen another video of that Polonitsa, a new missile type UAV developed in Ukraine. So if uh, that story ends up being with more than one uh, dev article, but with actual production, then uh, it may cause more havoc on Russian airfields. And the third factor, again, according to Boston taxi drivers, uh, is that uh, America has some issues with uh, President Biden. When the person is undergoing too much medical treatment, it's difficult for him to run the country. And several groups, several power groups in Washington are duking it out between themselves, and the whole situation with the election year is not helping to stabilize everything. So there is a situation now, and we are using it. Because we see probably two options as an exit out of this situation. Our blows may be very painful for Russia, and they might start moving in the right direction on negotiations. Seriously moving, not just saying that, okay, let's pause the hits on energy infrastructure until the elections in the US. And second option would be if we miscalculate and Russia will not move, will not budge on the negotiation front and would become even uh, sterner in their position and will try to conduct mobilization with all the difficult uh, outcomes. But you know that I do support here President Zelensky and our actions for a simple reason, because there are more important things than energy systems. I understand it's difficult for some to believe that, but uh, even square kilometers are not the most important things that are occupied. And Taryetsk and Pakrovsk are also not as important as some people think. I think the archetype, the banner under which you are operating, matters a lot more than that. And I wrote that again today, that it's better to temporarily withdraw like Svetoslav to prevail later than to temporarily win like Catherine. And people in Ukraine understand what history pieces I am referring to. It's better to temporarily withdraw but remain victors than uh, temporarily win but remain a victim. As long as we maintain the framework of owning the strategy of conducting active operations, of being the author of events, this is probably most important than all the individual townships, square kilometers, or all attacks on the energy infrastructure. Because Russians are betting on being not punishable and the fact that Ukraine can do nothing about their incursion. And they've been torturing Ukraine for too long, I think. Ten years of this uh, conflict, and before that there was Tuzla and some others. And Tuzla, we actually kicked them back. But yeah, they've been rolling us like a meat patty, like a burger patty, and just biting and taking bites on different sides as they liked. But when we switch from defense into attack, when we actually incur, incur different operations on their territory, that's when they start feeling the pain. That's when they find themselves in a difficult position. And one more thing I want our listeners to understand. According to the game theory, compromise option is uh, usually the losing game for both. Who's winning in this theory, according to this theory? Those who are staying closer to more extreme options. And what options can we talk about? Well, one of them is, for example, abandon the occupied territories and let's uh, develop the territories that we held. And I'm sorry for those people who live in the occupied territories, but for example, that's one of the ways. We create collective system of defense in Europe, modernize Ukraine, boost up our military production complex fight with corruption, this is one of the options. I was insisting on that because for a year we were rolling down the hill into abyss and there were no even reasons to start thinking that we'll ever get out of the archetype of always crying um, Katharina who is uh, always withdrawing and can only post crying posts on the social media. Apparently we can behave as Svetoslav and now we have a second option, if not a f military victory, like full military victory, but at least a military parity, or uh, giving Russia certain hard military blows after which they, for real, will budge and change their position on this. So we can physically perhaps bring them to a situation when they cannot realize their threats. But for that, that's another extreme version. For this, we need to transfer our economy to the military format, we need to continue with mobilization, we need to create conditions 
for massive attacks on Russian territory. This is another variant. We are right now in the middle between the two. Those people who have lived enough and uh, who are somewhat conservatively looking at that uh, are saying that, well, you know, Ukraine will probably fail to mobilize enough. Look at your Aristovich, you're probably an agent of Moscow, kind of disheartening some of the Ukrainians and telling them the truth. So what is the real question behind this attitude? The question is whether our society is really ready to the border version of peace, armed peace, or total war. And the society is not ready. Society is not trusting our government because they see how government behaves towards that society. And that's the problem. We need to concentrate either on one or the other of the extreme versions, right? Either push them militarily or draw the line, set the wall and arm ourselves and make ourselves a hard target for, for them to incur ever again. But the society is not ready to take one or the other. That's why we are walking somewhere in the middle, and our official and unofficial rhetoric is still closer to the second option of a total war and total mobilization, and one can see a, different, uh, a definite disconnect between rhetoric and actions. I've been um, criticizing that approach for the last year, and I continue doing so, because in order to provide for implementation of one of the extreme options that we have, it takes different approach. President Zelensky cannot go for the peace extreme option because his administration may run into a um, local junta in Ukraine at uh, takeover, another Maidan, which would be a catastrophe for Ukraine if military will take over. And some, some people dream that military will start doing economy. Our economy will not survive that management and will probably not hold the front as well. So he cannot go that way. We cannot also mobilize fully because people do not want to get mobilized. They don't want to totally join the army, stand uh, in the production factories and uh, make those mines and guns. So we're staying in the middle. The compromise option, it's the worst. It's neither one nor the other. But uh, we do have a question in this regard. What is the real strategy then for today? The real strategy for today is an option B, somewhat softened, to lead to a strengthened option A. So we need to continue destroying Russia on the front, hitting it in every painful area where we can, in order to move them on the negotiation position to a more compromise place. It was a difficult solution for us, especially given the position of our partners and their tempo of supplies. But we are facing now an interesting window because American administration is too busy within itself. Russia is not on a peak of military capability. It's too long for them to mobilize and they're not even, uh, they haven't decided yet. So we got that small window when we can actually hit Russia and get them to move. And we have uh, started walking in that direction. That's good. This is a good decision taken by military political leadership of Ukraine. They're responsible for it. And again, this is not the last decision. And I think to the very last day of this war, there'll still be some fog of war and some unclear elements of where we're going. But let's imagine that this uh, strategy failed and we are failed into another round of this war. They're destroying our energy systems. They're mobilizing, we're mobilizing. We have to lower the conscription age because we need to be able to draft enough people to hold the front. And there could be another year of war, but here, it's not the year of war that's concerning the most, even though it's mobilization and war itself, of course, is trouble. The question is, how will we fight this war? Shall we go into defense or whether we will be attacking? If we will be attacking, like Svetoslav character, this will be a problem this extra year, but not that big of a problem. We'll actually use it to grow and to change historic destiny of Ukraine. But if we'll be just defending ourselves and weathering Russian blows, then why the heck are we fighting? Then we need to sit down and negotiate and concentrate on rebuilding and developing what we have, proving on peace uh, project and peace process that we are authors and we are not victims and rebuilding Ukraine in a new fashion. So for me, it's not so much about the war or peace. There are more things that are more important than that. 
And it's time to speak about that. This is about who we are in this war, who we are in this peace. If we are Svetoslavs, we can continue this war for another 50 years. If we're a Catherine, uh, then it doesn't make sense for us to continue fighting this war. We need to sit down at the table today. And it, it, like, if we really are the character of Katerina Likes, uh, it doesn't even, it's not even clear why do we need to live. And that's why I think this aspect is more important for me than the topic of war and peace in general. All right, Alexei, if we we'll look towards more situational matters and reactions to those, the occupation of Kursk district, and you have mentioned that in your previous streams, this is a significant achievement of Ukrainian armed forces and political leadership of Ukraine. I remember Zelensky was insisting on counteroffensive on numerous occasions. He was saying that it's not a stalemate, there are other options. And as the practice uh, revealed, that option indeed materialized. And given how it was implemented, it seems that we have even more options. One can look along the border and see that there are more options for operations like this. Even those people who do not understand much in war, but they can deduce that uh, back a while ago, we managed to run Kharkov operation to liberate Kharkov district, Izum, and uh, a big chunk of our territory there. Kherson operation was a success. Those were two successful moments. And even between those two points, one could draw a line and say, okay, we can do that. Now we have a third point, even after such a long protracted offensive by Russia with a lot of losses on our side to hold them. So this operation reveals that there are capabilities and there are chances, if we are decisive enough and if we plan things well enough. I also noticed that this week there was published um, not even an interview, but uh, Ukrainian uh, Pravda was discussing the sources of information in the 80th Brigade that was participating in the Kursk operation. And before it participated in it, there was a loud uh, firing of a Brigade Commander who was replaced. So they discussed the video where the possible reason for firing of that brigade commander Ishkulov was his uh, probable refusal from conducting this operation to lead his brigade in this operation in uh, Kursk district. So here everything that ends pretty much in the will of a certain brigade commander. Is it true? Can it really be so that certain brigade commander needs to be removed in order to get brigade to execute the task that uh, they're facing? Well, Nikolai, we already have seen that sometimes you need to remove a general in order to make things happen. You can remove anybody. If brigade commander is refusing to execute such an order, it deserves an investigation and uh, understanding of what really was his reasoning. Perhaps he needs to see the bigger picture and get more information. Maybe he will change his mind. Um, military officer refusing to carry out the order is uh, by default putting himself in a um, bad position, but it deserves investigation. And um, that brigade commander, he has very good uh, characteristics in his own brigade with neighbors that were working with him, but he looked at the ideation and he made his decision that he perhaps would not want to go there and uh, went into an open conflict with his commanding officers. This is not normal. This can be explained, this can be figured out, but uh, de facto, this is not normal. Brigade commander, not an uh, infantryman, is refusing to carry out the order. So something may be amiss there. On the other hand, the system of military relations in Ukraine implies that the general is to communicate with the lieutenant as the youngest officer as with an equal colleague officer and they together jointly are to solve the situation what is the best way to conduct to carry out the operation and there are a lot of traditions around that and examples for example at what level will the commanding officer allow his subordinates to address him without using the full rank and address a real good one would suggest that after the initial communication, drop the titles, let's talk. And that's 
even with lieutenant, uh, they should sit down and work at the table. That's how the officers' core work, and they discuss as colleagues the details of operation. So it's a question of military culture. It's a question of details. There are elder officers that I know who are saying that uh, that brigade commander Ishkov is 100% uh, wrong. There are also others whom I know, very um, authoritative figures, who are saying that actually he has a point and we need invest to conduct an investigation. Now the 80th Brigade is conducting their goals in the Kursk district. We can understand that uh, they can change uh, Colonel Ishkolov to somebody, but Brigade always has a commander, so somebody is commanding them. And one needs to know details to really give a more reasonable verdict here. Need to understand what uh, was given to him, what command uh, was including, how was it delivered, was he participating in the development, was he ignored. And it's not uh, in, it shouldn't be in a public domain, it should be investigated with uh, special military services. So, Alexei, I would not want our streams to be attacking somebody, but since the situation bubbled up to the surface, uh, and it takes some attention of our people in the country, it, it deserves to discuss it, because even archetypically, what would be the right way, what would be the right approach? Because a lot of in the armed forces of Ukraine, including brigade commanders, they're looking at these situations and facing them sometimes for the first time in their life, because, uh, you know, it's the first time when Ukrainian armed forces occupied a piece of Russian proper, right? I don't remember we have any situation like that in our recent history, modern history. So that whole adventurism of this operation, but on the other hand, from the practical side, how correct was uh, the operation implemented, and people are facing these choices, right? Those people who, needs, who need to hold the wheel of the vehicle roaming in Kursk district, those people who are shooting at Russian troops defending their country. So, Perhaps one needs to see a bigger picture, that's where I'm going. I understand that the background, background before we started this operation was very noisy. There were a lot of investigations between the officers, a lot of uh, attacks coming from Mariana Bizuglia on the officers' score on the generalty. So the accents were in a different pain. And now we are seeing that firing on one hand, and that brigade commander of the 80th, and then we do have a successful uh, or lucky result of incursion into Kursk district. So I think it makes sense to draw some conclusions out of this situation, even without any court statements and uh, accus accusations of anybody. Well, listen, Nikolai, the army code has details on what is the officer to do after receiving an order. Point number one is to understand it, so he needs to understand the task in all nuance, as he is being given. If he doesn't understand something, he needs to ask. Second, he needs to estimate the environment, estimate the circumstance. That includes the territory, the opponent, and the self. And, for example, he may be saying that, you know, with my current forces, I do not have a capability to carry out this task. I request to refit us, provide us additional training, additional ammunition, more armor, and maybe two weeks to prepare, for example, right? Or he can say, we in general are not ready because our moral state does not allow us to carry out this operation. Then his command has to review that situation, including his position, whether he is commander of brigade or platoon or commander-in-chief, or then it's a uh, president who is uh, estimating the censor. And they can come to a conclusion that, okay, if not you, then uh, we'll put another officer in, in your place and we'll look for a different position for you. And that's normal, one way or the other. So all this is acceptable, right? Brigade commander has the right to say that. Is that true, Alexei? Yeah. Every commander, starting with the platoon commander, that's his flow of work, that's his flow of action. Do you think there should be some punishment, some repercussions for such a behavior? Well, it depends upon the reality and how realistic is he in his estimation. Because, of course, you can demote him, you can fire him, you can do other disciplinary measures. But the question is, what are we achieving with them? 
if we indeed are sitting down with him and discussing the situation with the pencil and calculating the real probability, and he really shows with proof that guys know this is not enough, do this and then I'm ready to carry out, that's a different situation. And if he is saying, and I'm not going to do that in principle because of some other convictions, that's another situation, right? We don't know the motivation that Ishkolov presented to his command after being given the details of this operation. It's difficult for us to estimate that, but for military in general, it's a bad stance to say that I'm not going to carry out the order. Same thing as for the superior, it's not good to not discuss the order in details with the officer who will have to carry it out, without ranks, but very factually sit down and discuss the details, regardless whether one is a general and another is lieutenant. This is normal in a good environment, in a good officer core environment. We cannot guarantee that it is good, unfortunately, but um, that's the order in uh, principle. And yeah, if he's uh, ideologically opposing, opposed to this operation, then it's different. That could be a more uh, lasting consequences and repercussions that could he could be facing. All right, Alexei, what about our long-range attacks? We attacked, uh, I think, Omsk oil refinery after some explosion, and some witnesses comment that there were UAVs seen around it. So it's interesting, though, that the distance from where we could launch something in this direction and Omsk oil refinery is two and a half thousand kilometers. Can we act, actually say that we have a tool that can reach two and a half thousand kilometers uh, deep in the Russian territory? Well, Nikolai, we're also attacking Karelia in Russia. It's, uh, what, 1,200 kilometers. So we've been flying for over a thousand. Don't know about two and a half thousand if we can reach that threshold, but if people are saying that it was UAV and somebody can provide proof, then it's a new stage of our capability growth. Essentially, that's a similar distance that uh, they use when they launch uh, their ballistic missiles at us. Okay, I'll ask another strange question, but perhaps in the lieu of today's discussion, it makes sense to address it. In your view, Omsk oil refinery is not far from the border with Kazakhstan. Do you think maybe Kazakhstan territory was used? Oh yeah, no, Nikolai. Nobody used Kazakhstan territory for sure. Same thing as some people were speculating that Finland or Estonia territories were used to attack Karelia. No, other countries don't want to get into this hot war and it's uh, difficult. Why is it difficult? Well, first of all, small UAV is difficult to small is difficult to get UAV there to the other territory. You need to bring it. You need to bring parts or the whole UAV, right? And small one Probably, technically, you can do that, right? But if Kazakhs, for example, would have discovered that, that would have been an international scandal. The relations of Ukraine with Kazakhstan and China standing behind them would have worsened. I don't think even the full destruction of oil refinery in Omsk is worth that. So I don't think anybody would go for it. I'm not saying it's us, Alexei. It could have been some private persons who are not controlled by anybody. Well, yeah, it could be, and nothing we can do about that. If we catch them, we can punish them, right? But um, on one hand, we can give them the title of a hero of Ukraine, but on the other hand, we'll still have to uh, somehow, maybe verbally, but punish them. Also, Alexei, for the eighth day, the fire is raging in Rostov oil base. What's the problem there? Oh, that's a not simple base, Nikolai. This is strategic storage. These are the ones that are supposed to feed military districts. For example, Southern Military District, which has headquarters in Rostov-on-Don. So over there, there is a huge storage and it blew up in such a fashion and the fire started so rapidly that firemen just don't have adequate tools. Uh, some people are saying that the fire is raging in the city already. Uh, well, a mast strike can lead that. It started in several places and then it burned together in one huge flame and it's very difficult to take it out now. What else do we know about Russian oil? I think 
after the first attacks, which caused a big scandal in Washington, um, what do you think uh, is Washington thinking about that now? I think they came to peace with that. And, you know, they're also mixed here, because some of them actually welcome all that. Others who have some investments in the oil infrastructure, they're saying, well, they're not too happy. But uh, there is a group in Washington that definitely is welcoming all these attacks. And, you know, I'm glad that Ukraine is not asking for permission and just going ahead and attacking targets in Russia. And we've been very orderly in destroying the logistics of the southern district. We've been attacked, attacking uh, that oil refinery, uh, oil storage. Then we destroyed also the ferry terminal that was transporting things to Crimea. And uh, the ferry actually got very sad and drowned. So, yeah, this is a very systemic approach on the strategic and the operative level. I think we can be congratulated for this achievement. For two years we've been trying to conduct these attacks and finally we are at the level where we can hit attacks, hit their targets rather carefully. Another fire this week, uh, 5,000 tons of ammo in the vicinity of Varonish. And what is Varonish? This is the group that is feeding with logistics, uh, everything on the Kharkov direction. So, yeah, Russia is starting to face some blowback. We are starting to work systemically on their logistics. That can only be welcomed. And those people in poor Washington who are crying about it, well, they can continue crying and uh, the others will be applauding. Um, let's talk about Modi's visit. There are some estimations that this is uh, not too successful of a visit, that President Zelensky administration did not uh, get big enough results from this visit. But I did review, uh, formally we have signed four significant rather agreements. There is a statement about strategic partnership, about military cooperation. What else do you think we should have been asking for? Perhaps Nikolai commentators wanted India to start war against Russian Federation, but I think that they left that for the next visit, right? <laughs> Right, immediately. Um, they've been working with Russia for quite an extensive time. So it's difficult to expect India starting a war with Russia. But otherwise, this visit, I think, is pretty successful. Four strategic agreements for years to come, building systemic relations, exchange in certain areas from technology to some just humanitarian good things. I don't know how you, one can call this visit unsuccessful. I think, yeah, you can smear anything you want, but um, perhaps I don't understand something. It looks rather successful for me. And maybe those people who criticize, they see something else. You know what I paid attention to in this context? The fact itself that Modi flew to Ukraine, and it's not President Zelensky who was visiting him in India. This is... Um, a significant factor telling us that India is building their own construct, right? Their own politics. And not only regional, but already probably of a global character. How do you see that? What is India building? They're building alternative pathways to Europe and themselves as new China for the West. What role do you think Ukraine is playing in this? We are the territory that um, they pay interest to. First of all, our technology, and then as an infrastructure link in this chain, plus humanitarian aspect, of course. And this is not just a breakthrough visit, it's literally setting up new relations between countries. Especially, it looks good on the backdrop of a 33-year-old abyss between our countries and some scandals in there. So the fact that Modi visited us, not Zelensky going there, it shows that India is exploring new direction, also, it should be reviewed in the light of Kuleba's visit to China, because India is very attentively looking at things happening around China. They're their main competitor. And since China is playing very actively on the Belarus field, India, it makes sense that they picked Ukraine to play here. And these visits take time to prepare. It is prolonged action. There was a lot of preparatory work Indians were evaluating opportunities. And finally, their prime minister had uh, visited Ukraine and uh, started this process. This is his achievement on the geopolitical chessboard. This is a great story. 
India is at least starting to build an alternative path to Chinese Silk Road to transport goods from Asia to Europe. India is looking for their own road, and um, they understood that a road through Saudi Arabia and Greece is problematic, so they're looking for alternative. They're not dumping the other one, but Ukraine territory is providing connectivity to a great degree between Asia and Europe. It's difficult to miss us on the way to Europe. If you really want to be sending goods from Asia to Europe, Ukraine is obviously the link that you have to go through. And that's where they're building their relations. All right, I want to argue a little about how one cannot circumvent Ukraine. I don't know how would they be building logistics on the ground through Ukraine, given that we also have some communication issues some roads issues. Well, no, this is, Nikolai, also a topic of security of Black Sea region. This is part of that Tri-C agreement, Black Sea and the Baltics. And uh, you can see that the grain is going through Black Sea, right? Is India interested in the grain going from Ukraine to feed the world? Yeah, they have over a billion of people and they have a lot of them to feed. At some point, this war will be over. For example, there is some logistics going through Azerbaijan, but after that you go where? Russia? Belarus? But there are China representatives there. They'll likely be betting against India there. You can go to Baltic countries, but that's a longer shoulder. Or you can make a quick detour around Ukraine, to Ukraine, and uh, I don't think it'll be just Ukraine. I think it'll be also Bulgaria and Greece, Romania and reach Europe pretty quickly. Austria and that southern part, the central Germany, France. So India is like China for us, right? We are rather dependent on different Chinese uh, manufacturing capabilities, technological devices that we use for our UAVs manufacturing. Do you think India can be a reliable or strong partner in this regard too? Well, Nikolai, growth should not be expected to be rapid. These things take time to fruit. It may be a decade before we reach the flourishing state in our trade relations. But one can remember that the country is as independent as far it plans its activities. So if you're planning for 10 years, that's your window. If you're planning for 50 years, that's your window of independence. So then, Alexei, all technologies, whatever we have now, whatever we're building, it's not about achieving a quick result, but uh, generally about starting to work with them, right? Right, Nikolai. Engineering, starting with production, starting with education of trade uh, in trade school, in enge educational engineers in the universities, perhaps the exchange of different engineers. It takes decades to grow these engineers. It, it takes decades to grow certain industries. And it's great that we're starting now. Soviet school and Soviet capabilities are destroyed and somebody needs to rebuild that, so... All right, Durov, the owner of Telegram. I was waiting for when we can get to this matter. I think it's a very important question, given the importance of Telegram in all kinds of communication. And, of course, Durov's arrest in France is uh, shaking Russian media and... Um, there are a lot of different rumors about Russia start, starting to leave Telegram or, you know, being concerned with Telegram having a backdoor that may be revealed to foreign countries. So what is good about Telegram, Nikolai? Telegram is great in the fashion that it, in the way it encodes data. There are no keys that Durov can have or give to somebody. And that's what France was talking about, that a lot of criminals also use this capability because it's... Uh, encrypted. So I was talking to Paris taxi drivers and what they're saying. They're saying that Durov was not really arrested. Even there is no accusation. When people are saying that he can be maybe accused in 12 articles, that the keyword is can or may. There is no accusation yet. He flew to France and he was detained. He is not arrested. He is detained due to a very 
specific situation, by a very specific article in uh, France, in uh, Germany, and in America. And in France, they are viewing him as the French citizen, since Telegram is being abused by groups who exchange uh, uh, all kinds of illegal pornography, arms, drugs. They have a lot of questions to ask from Durov. And they invited him three times to visit France to discuss that, and he refused. So, as in every country, there is a process when a person of interest can be brought to such a discussion. So, when he flew on the territory of France, he was detained and he was delivered to communicate with French justice. Perhaps he will be let go tomorrow. Perhaps they will present him with accusations and not let him go. But given that President Macron came out only on the third day of that detainment, I think that the main part of that orchestra is played by Americans. Because detainment imply, doesn't include normally jailing. The fact that they're detaining him for several days, it's uh, probably an American style. It looks more like them. But one can say that he's a billionaire. Billionaires usually have a lot of money, good lawyers, and that's very rare for a billionaire to actually be jailed. So, unless there is some really brutal violation of some law, I do not see him jailed, I do not see him in prison. According to the state of things to the afternoon today, when I talked with my French uh, colleagues, um, he was not accused of anything, he was just brought for conversation. So the story is much smaller than it was blown to be, and all these libertarians and the proponents of freedom of speech and proponents of a strong state and proponents of safety and rights, uh, how they squabble between each other and different views, I think we should wait a little, maybe the next couple of days, because they have to either accuse him in the next two days or let him go. According to the French law, on the 28th this time expires. So. they will either let him go or they will have to accuse him of something. So, two more days. But I want to, again, re-emphasize here that there are no keys that he can give. Even Telegram himself, uh, the admins of Telegram do not see what's happening in the chats. This is designed, this is by design, very high level of reliability. That's why Russian troops were using Telegrams too, and we do as well, and French services have no way to access these chats. It's impossible to, there's no master key. The problem is that one can get a lot of information just by looking at who is the administrator of a certain channel. That information is accessible without reading who and what is writing in that channel. You can see who is the admin, who are his friends, whom is he communicating with. So that may be worth of money and detainment and some other things. So how legal is it? It is legal. Um, how legal it is for France to detain him, it is legal as well. He's a citizen of France, so, right? And French law implies that uh, you need to cooperate with court, with the judicial system. The degree of that communication will be determined between the lawyers and the legal system, judicial system. But uh, he cannot avoid that. So he's not arrested, he's just detained. He is uh, forcibly detained to discuss the matter with French jurisprudence. How did he end up there? I think he was probably flying to a different meeting, and then he was detained because of that. I still think there probably is American trace in this. Alexei, I'm listening to you, and I think you, I have a feeling that you know more than you are disclosing. Well, this is a legal matter, Nikolai. One needs to be careful in what can be disclosed. But the matter is, the war is going on. And in the war, one needs to take one side or the other. And people can, those people who think that they can stay above the war, it's a difficult situation. If you're a private person and you're a poet, okay, maybe. But if you're a person who is holding a communication tool that is being held and used by billions of people, it's impossible for you to be neutral. And in all countries, in all times, big businessmen have to choose whether they'll be working with one side or with another. And if it is the fight against uh, terrorism by special services. 
And all businessmen, one way or another in the West, usually took the side of the government, because this is an obvious decision. If a businessman makes a decision that he's a libertarian and the government is oppressing, then he starts to play, whether he likes it or not, to the opposite side, to the ones who are fighting with the government. And that usually causes uh, very idiosyncratic issues with uh, the government systems, and he is then facing pretty bad consequences. So can the person who owns the communicating tool where about a billion people are communicating actively, predominantly the leading tool in the Russian-speaking part of the world. Can he remain neutral? Well, technically he cannot disclose those ciphers and codes, there are no keys, right? So what is cooperation in this matter? But the fact that he still has to communicate with the judicial system, this is definitely a fact. And he is still not arrested. He was invited for a conversation. Right, he three times refused. There was ongoing judicial process and lawyers were actually already involved in communicating with French government on this behalf. So, at least according to French taxi drivers. In the ideal world, in the libertarian world, of course, the freedom of speech should not be infringed on, right? But we are living in the real world, it's different. Where there is illegal porn, exploitation of people, organized crime, terrorists and all kind of stuff happening using the same tools, what they can find. And one needs to take sides. Another interesting moment here, Alexei, six days ago, I think it was on the 20th of August, in Russian media, there was a publication that was widely discussed, referring to Telegram channel Baza. Putin refused to meet with Durov in Azerbaijan. It was known that Durov flew to Azerbaijan and he was there when Putin was visiting this country when he was meeting with Aliyev. And what was spread via that Baza channel? A few days before the visit, the members of Putin's administration suggested, offered him to conduct a meeting with Durov, but Putin refused. So even from that small mention, What's happening, one, what, what one can deduce is that Durov at least wanted to meet with Putin. There was an idea. He even flew to that country. Even if that meeting did not occur, which is also doubtful, the information that it could have happened became known. And the third story is that Durov supposedly knew that, um, by the way, he, uh, he does indeed own the passport of a French citizen. Durov supposedly knew that uh, he is a wanted person in France. No, 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 Nikolai, he is not a wanted person in France. Well, maybe his legal status was such that he told, told somebody that he is wanted there, but he still flew there. Well, the story says this is a long story. It started in May, and this was apparently a third request by French prosecutors to have communication with him. After the third request, they actually have a right to detain him for communication. Um, so this is a lengthy story that started supposedly in May. It's uh, already involving a bunch of lawyers on his side and, of course, on the government side. So again, French taxi drivers are saying that this this is how it unfolded. I understand that some people want to add conspirology, to add maybe Putin's visit, and French want to know what did he talk to Putin about. But this is not how it works in relation to billionaires. The lawyers are usually very talented to prevent these things from happening. And government has to be very accurate in how they conduct these things. You can see that even Tucker Carlson and Elon Musk already chimed in. So even on the media front, you have to be very careful. I can say that perhaps maybe he had a secret meeting with Putin and French side wanted to ask him about it too and he either told them or not, but that reeks of James Bond movie. Well, sorry for interrupting you here, but you're saying that the war is raging, right? And one needs to define which side you're on. And looking at Durov's attempt to meet Putin in Azerbaijan, perhaps he wanted to meet Putin there. Is he going? Was he going to move to Putin's side? No, not necessarily, Nikolai. Where's the guarantee that he wanted personally to meet him? Well, people are writing, well, you know, people can write. We don't know, we don't know for a fact. That's why I suggest to use the information that we have. 
He was detained in France. He is not arrested. There are no accusations. We'll see what happens on the 28th when the time runs out, according to French law. Okay. One last question. That'll sound silly in regards to what we already discussed. But there are some people who are of an opinion in our social media that Durov flew to France to surrender, to give himself up. To give himself up for what? What has he done? Well, the story goes that Putin supposedly gave him an ultimatum that he really did not like. Nikolai, the guy who has a billion dollars can protect himself from 10 Putins. You think so? Sure, he can hire a lot of bodyguards that will prevent any of the Putin's agents to get to him, and perhaps even with some missile defense if he needs to. So I don't think he is afraid of any threats from Putin. And again, what do you mean by giving up? Come to France and sit down in a well-guarded mansion? He can create a mansion like that anywhere. He can go to the United States. Putin will not go there, for sure. So don't think this is a real one. Scary Putin threatening Durov? No, doesn't smell right. When you have a billion, you can easily work with your opponent and change their weight at your liking. So um, I don't think that's what's happening. I think that's all about what the real things that were disclosed, that his uh, messenger became a communication tool that is one of the leading constructs for international terrorism and organized crime and uh, trafficking people and something needs to be done about it. It's, uh, shouldn't, it shouldn't be played as neutrality on his side. He needs to take his side in this uh, and make a decision. All right, I think this matter we can close. End of the first hour.